ChatGPT passed an MBA exam. Here to talk about this controversial software and its potential to disrupt education, business, and other industries is Ethan Mollick, an associate professor at Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Ethan. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, so you've introduced this technology in your classrooms. Can you talk about how you've added that into your lessons and, and what outcome have you seen since doing so? Yeah, so it has really been fairly transformative. I teach entrepreneurship and innovation. I was a former entrepreneur myself. And uh, I've made it mandatory for my students to use this technology. And the effect has been pretty huge. Um, people who weren't good writers are now good writers. Um, I can assign more work than I did before. The quality of ideas is better. It's actually been pretty amazing to see all of the impacts. Uh, there's a lot of downsides, too. So it also gives the students a chance to work through that and understand why the limits of these tools are and when they might be appropriate and when they may not be. Right. What are some of those downsides or do you see, do you see this as a, a necessary tool that's going to be in the business world and as a requirement to, to have your students use in order to be acquainted with it before they leave their education? Um, let, let's just, you know, just give you some context. Uh, GPT 3.5, chat GPT, which we're talking about, came out at the end of November on like a Thursday. The next Tuesday, I taught my undergraduate entrepreneurship class at, at uh, Penn, at Wharton, and um, I introduced it to my students who have mostly had not seen it before. By the end of the first class, one of the students during the class coded up a demo, a tech demo for uh, their product that they were developing in the class using software libraries they never used before. I posted on Twitter, by the end of the night, they had three VC offers. By the Thursday, two days later, 80% of the class was using chat to do different kinds of things, help them answer test questions, help them understand why they got problems wrong, come with ideas for a student club, uh, having them explain things like there were five, all sorts of different things. So it's already pretty ubiquitous as a tool and it does a lot of things. We don't even know everything it does yet. So the plus sides are already there, like it's already expanding use in lots of ways. You just have to be aware that it lies a lot, makes up material, there's some downsides as well. Right. You know, it's been a bit controversial in terms of this technology and how students are using it on a university level as well as K through 12. Uh, do you think that there should be any sort of age limits or do you think that there could be uses for this technology um, for younger students to be using it in different ways? I mean, so there's a lot of ways to potentially use this. There, one way to think about this, there's a lot of things this tool does. But in education, one clear analogy is to the calculator, right? So before calculators, you did all your math by hand. After calculators, we had to find a balance where you did enough math by hand to understand basic math, but then it let us do much more advanced math in high school because you didn't have to calculate everything by hand. In the same way, there's uses for this from the beginning of school on, um, but we need to make sure people still learn to write, right, and still have a chance to do those kind of things, that we know what people are producing and what work they're not producing and that they're being original. But I think that there's use for this tool, even as a research tool for much younger kids, and the art tools allow them to create images. I mean, it really expands human capability. How about the concerns in terms of plagiarism? Is that something that you've encountered in your classroom as you've introduced this tool, or are there ways that you're trying to, to keep that in check as you have your students use ChatGPT? So there's a few things. First, plagiarism has always been ubiquitous. Like, students cheat, right? We have all this evidence that, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people cheat. Um, a lot of people search for answers on the internet. In fact, the usefulness of homework uh, homework used to predict test scores. If people did the homework, they'd get high test scores. In the last five years or six years, that's been decoupled because people who do the homework uh, are often cheating. So they don't actually get better test scores. They don't learn. So cheating was already everywhere. Um, so part of what my goal was is how do we think about how ChatGPT fits in? So I require my students to acknowledge when they use it and to give me the prompts that they use in order to solicit those results and often to reflect in a paragraph on what worked and what didn't. And you force them to be critical readers and thinkers of their own, their own material that they're producing and get some really impressive results. Right. And what has the feedback been from your students since they've had you know, this requirement or this um, encouragement to use ChatGPT in their lessons? I mean, generally they love it. I think everyone is a little bit nervous. Uh, not so much about what happens in the classroom, but what happens afterwards. The capabilities of these models is increasing tremendously. Uh, I just got access yesterday to Bing's AI, which is as big an improvement over ChatGPT as ChatGPT was over the previous AI models. And so the real question is, okay, I'm preparing them for a world where they can use these tools. Um, what does work look like when they graduate is a really interesting question. 
Right. And in, in terms of that business and industry side, are there certain things that you think policymakers and regulators should be aware of as they're looking at this technology in terms of wanting to add those guardrails in place to, to keep the public safe, but also wanting to balance that without hampering innovation in any way, which I know companies have really been on the forefront of expressing? So I think it's a really complex question, right? On one hand, we have the idea of guardrails or ethics. That's one of the things that made ChatGPT so reasonably easy to integrate into a classroom is the guardrails are quite good. It's It can be frustrating to people that it doesn't say everything you want it to say, but it's also very hard to get it to be really dangerous. That may not be true with future models, right, where you can ask it to convince you of something that isn't true and it does a really plausible job. I have been fooled by fake GPT output when they actually cited one of my articles that I never wrote. And I was like, wait, is this something I wrote and forgot about? Because it seemed plausible enough. So there is this kind of information danger to worry about. But in terms of its use, uh, even in early studies before ChatGPT, some of the early AI tools were showing that it cut the amount of time involved in programming in half. Um, people are talking about 30 to 80 percent uh, improvements in how much time they need to spend to get tasks done. So I think we're going to see it used everywhere. I think we need to make sure those guardrails are in place. Definitely. And would you encourage other educators and other professors to start adding this in as a requirement or a part of the way that they're teaching their students? So I think one thing everybody should do is have a policy. We need to, you need to say what, the, what you're doing here and what the rules are. And it needs to be in the syllabus, right? The second thing is that you don't just have to use it as a tool to generate content, right? Um, I found one of the hardest things, actually we know one of the hardest things to teach is what's called transfer. The idea that I can teach you something in my class, but we apply it in the real world. And the only way you get really good at that is by trying to apply ideas lots of times. Well, ChatGTV is really good at this. You can say, show me how a bill becomes a law in a Seinfeld script. Show me how a bill becomes a law in the context of an alien invasion. And I actually have the students critique those various approaches to see, pull out subtly what is good and what is bad about this approach. So it actually helps you learn in an interesting way. So I think teachers should think about how it boosts learning and not just how it helps people do homework. Right. You know, I think there's also been a lot of discussions about how this could impact the workforce or if this will, will change jobs or take jobs away. Is that a concern you see or are there ways that you think that this could um, change the workforce for the better or worse in terms of companies and different industries relying on this new technology? So the... Standard answer to this is that technology only creates jobs, right? Since 1950, in the census, only one job has disappeared from the, since the 1950 census, that's elevator operator. But I don't know if that's true with chat. Uh, we don't know. Nobody knows the answer, right? If it really increases productivity by two or three times, and that's just these current models, and models are getting better at 10 times a year, what jobs get replaced becomes a really interesting question. What jobs get augmented? who becomes more productive and who doesn't. We don't actually have answers to any of those things yet. So I think anyone who tells you they know what the future is is probably wrong about this, but I think things are accelerating very quickly in ways that we have to really keep a close eye on. Definitely. And are there ways that you think young entrepreneurs, um, things that you recommend to your students as they may be entering the workforce with this new technology, um, ways that they can think about incorporating chat GPT or generative AI into business models and, and how to really use that to, to build from the ground up? Oh, absolutely. I've written a lot about this. I think that this is an amazing co-founder. So, you know, if you want to, let's say you're a doctor who no longer wants to practice medicine and launch a business, you can ask ChatGPT for 50 ideas on how to do it. It'll give you 50 ideas. And you might like idea number three, medical tourism. And you can say, give me a business plan for that. And you're like, well, now I need to contact someone. I write a letter to the FDA asking for permission to do this. And it'll do all of that. It'll even pretend to be another doctor you can interview. So there's a lot of information and help it can give you along the way directly to help your job. And then, of course, the idea that if this is going to affect every industry, it's a really great time to be an entrepreneur building software on top of it and not that complicated to do. Definitely. And are there ways that you've also used it not just to teach your students, but to, to ease your job as a professor? Um, has it been able to take over any of those more uh, you know, menial tasks? So the terrifying thing is, I think it does. I mean, in fact, I know it does, but I have resisted so far. So I had it, I asked it to create an MBA syllabus, and it created a great one for entrepreneurship, not as good as mine, hopefully, but a pretty good one. Uh, and then I said, well, can you add more readings by me? And it did that and rearranged the whole class. I asked it to create assignments and grading rubrics and grade papers. It does all of that. 
So um, there is an automated professor ability in it that's a little bit scary. Um, I have not used it for that other than trials yet. I can reassure any of my students who are watching or alumni who are watching. But um, I know people certainly will be doing that. And I think everybody should spend some time figuring out what parts of their job it automates. Uh, and you need about an hour of time, and you should absolutely be experimenting with chat to figure that out. Great. Thank you so much for, for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.